Um, so I have already sent you some uh, MCQs, basic MCQs. Uh, we'll go through this topic, which is quite common, uh, commonly asked at uh, long cases, and also tested uh, uh, in MCQs and sometimes in uh, SCQs as well. I'm sure you would have had lectures on these and uh, uh, some tutorial source would have been done. So, important thing is that uh, the whole idea is to sort of consolidate your knowledge so that uh, you carry it to the exam room. Um, here we go. Uh, I will start with a MCQ and I'm sure my whole idea is that you should get all right, everything right because I have a good knowledge. Uh, progressive dysphagia and uh, progressive dysphagia initially for solids is a sign of achalasia cardia. Uh, you all can try. Uh, this is apart from what I have already sent to you that is for your practice. Uh, any responses? Somebody says false. Yeah. Yeah, answer is false because as you already know, Echolasia cardia, the uh, initially the solids pass through the spastic segment at the low end and uh, later on only So progressive initial dysphagia is a sign of a mechanical obstruction rather than neuropathic obstruction. Uh, so initial progressive dysphagia for solids is a sign of uh, mechanical obstruction that is either carcinoma esophagus or the other courses we'll be discussing in a minute. Um, severe cough immediately after swallowing is a sign of locally advanced esophageal malignancy. Any attempts? Uh, there's a mixed response here. Some people say it's true. Yeah. The trick part of this question is that uh, severe cough immediately after swallowing. So immediately after swallowing, you know that two basic phases of uh, deglutition or swallowing is the esophageal, the pharyngeal phase and the esophageal phase. So immediately after swallowing, if there's any um, difficulty in swallowing, that is generally it is in the upper aerodigestive digestive tract that is either in the pharynx or upper esophagus. So uh, esophageal malignancy, we are talking about the, though you get malignancy in the upper esophagus, immediately after swallowing, it, is, it has to be a pharyngeal problem. So uh, yeah, so severe cough immediately after swallowing is a sign of locally advanced yeah, actually, this this part we have to concentrate is the locally advanced part. Okay, so uh, tracheoesophageal fistula is the one you have to think of. Theory. Yeah. Somebody has given the reason also. Yeah. Uh, and immediate regurgitation. If the MCQ says if it is immediate regurgitation, difficulty in swallowing and regurgitation. Uh, you have to think of upper esophageal uh, dysphagia problems such as Senkers diverticulum or pharyngeal pouch. So, uh, cough is uh, generally either is a tracheoesophageal fistula or it could be, I mean, it's a late uh, regurgitation, it could be echolasia with uh, all soiled food collected in the esophagus. Dysphagia during the first phase of deglutition is more likely to be a neurological in origin. Anybody would like to try? Yeah, as I was explaining, the initial first phase of the deglutition is uh, generally it is due to pharyngeal problems. Though you can get malignant uh, causes of uh, uh, pharyngeal dysphagia, uh, answer is true because you have to think more in terms of uh, neurological problems uh, like uh, like CVAs and bulbar palsies, pseudobulbar palsies and those problems. Orinophagia is most 
often caused by an enlarged right atrium. Odinophagia is, what is odinophagia? Odinophagia is painful degradation caused by enlarged right atrium. Anybody? Give it a try. True, false, 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 false. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, right atrium, enlarged right atrium. Is false because generally uh, rhinophagia is more associated with uh, motility disorders. As you know, there are a number of motility disorders out of which Echelasia cardia is the commonest, but uh, there are many others like corkscrew esophagus, esophageal diffuse esophageal spasm, and then then uh, you get the neurological disorders like Chagas disease. So, uh, odinophagia is more associated with that uh, than. Uh, any other uh, external compression, cause of dysphagia given as an external compression. This right atrial or atrial dilatation is an external compression of esophagus. Reflux is more associated with dysphagia than regurgitation. Reflux is more associated with dysphagia than regurgitation. Any guesses? A lot of people are marking it false. It's false, yes. It's the other way around. Uh, Reflux disease uh, is more associated with regurgitation rather than uh, yeah, a dysphagia. Uh, another EMQ, external match, uh, extended matching uh, question. Uh, just to uh, recapitulate uh, or test your knowledge on the clinical aspect of it. Um, 69 year old woman with nocturnal uh, nocturnal cough, halitosis and basal pneumonia. You have to select the answer from the other side. Um, can you quickly rush through the screen and then say what it is? Yeah, I think for, by mistake that's answer has come up yeah so uh, anyway uh, this is a classical picture of uh, cough halitosis and basal pneumonia uh, answer is um, answer number five pharyngeal diverticulum because it's generally elderly, elderly woman and uh, diverticulum collects food and then in the night you get uh, this nocturnal coughs Halitosis because it is very close to the oral cavity uh, and uh, regurgitation often causes uh, aspiration type of pneumonia. 50 year old man with intermittent dysphagia, retrosternal pain and occasional regurgitation for one year without any other abnormality. Um, any guesses, numbers? Yeah. Intermittent dysphagia, retrosternal pain, occasional regurgitation for one year without any other. So it has been going on for one year. So that is something you have to think of this type of question. Uh, because all these stems can come up in EMQs as well, uh, not uh, SEQs as well. Because this may be the short history and the questions will be asked. So unless you get the first diagnosis right, you will be discussing uh, something else. So uh, intermittent dysphagia and uh, retrosternal pain, occasional regurgitation. So if it is a regular regurgitation, of course, it will be a, you will be thinking more in terms of, more in terms of uh, sliding hernia, hiatus hernia and esophageal reflux disease. But in rolling hernia, esophageal, gastroesophageal junction is in the correct place. So it is in the, it's in the intra-abdominal location. So that reflux is, uh, occasional or much less regurgitated uh, reflux compared to uh, sliding hernias. Because in sliding hernia, the esophageal mechanism, the sphincter mechanism at the lower esophagus is disrupted, but not in rolling hernias. So that's why this occasional word is important. And uh, going on for one year means dysphagia is unlikely to be, you know, any, any other abnormality. That's the uh, hidden Clue going on for one year without any other abnormality is unlikely to be a malignant cause. 
So you have to think of uh, something benign. And this retrospheral pain, you get, uh, it can mimic, you know, even myocardial infarction, but uh, that is again a sign of some sort of a uh, hernia. So, uh, 40 year old man with intermittent dysphagia with severe retrosternal pain radiate into uh, arm, sorry, the swellings, uh, type of error, uh, radiate into the arm. Dysphagia with severe retrosternal pain radiate into the arm. It mimics uh, a myocardial infarction or, or anginal pain. And uh, but subsequently, I, we have given a clue here no cardiac abnormality. Can you think of uh, the suitable answer? Yeah, 3, 4, 3, 4, yeah, it's a mixed response. Um, the answer is 3, actually. Uh, young man, intermittent dysphagia with severe retrosternal pain. So this uh, coax through esophagus and esophageal diffuse esophageal spasm, the pain can be uh, really severe. It can mimic uh, my myocardial infarction and uh, the funny part is that uh, it may uh, radiate to the radiate down the arm 72 uh, two year old smoker with progressive dysphagia at retrosternal level for solids with low soft weight and re retaining a good appetite so the old man smoker is the Clue here yeah, with progressive dysphagia and retrosternal level. The level may not be 100% reliable when you think of the exact site of uh, the obstruction, but uh, patient often come and say that you know, food is getting stuck behind the sternum or at the uh, pharyngeal level. Uh, so, what do you think the answer is? Yeah, yeah, most of you all have got it right. Uh, why can't stem be a, a stride? So somebody has asked the question, uh, not GORD. Yeah. Uh, GORD is also possible because it can mimic a retrosternal pain. Uh, but then, uh, yes, the intermittent dysphagia, yeah, I think the, the thing fits to GORD as well. I mean, you can't say 100% because it's very Person. I agree even if you mark GORD because this was given as an additional stem uh, because uh, even GORD will be taken as right because this there's no way of identifying this uh, GORD uh, very specifically. So, uh, 35 year old man with dysphagia and nocturnal coughs regurgitation of foul smelling food and loss of appetite, loss of weight. Um, what does it fit into? Any guesses? Yeah, that's right. Calicia cardia, a lot of people have got it right. Um, okay, so uh, let us move on now. So, GORD is given as an extra stem, uh, additional stem, so that, uh, I mean, except for this, all the other things, GORD cannot be taken, because you have to think of the best answer. Let us move on quickly how dysphagia can come in a long case or a SCQ. Uh, basically, the case summary will be given to you. I think that this is what, how it will come. Uh, 60 year old man presenting with six months history of progressive dysphagia and initial solid uh, sorry uh, without regurgitation or bouts of cough after meals or chest shines loss of weight but maintains appetite he drinks socially but you are so this is at the end of your history this is how the case summary should come and uh, this is how the scq will stand uh, what is the differential diagnosis? Progressive dysphagia. And you have to be really lucky to get dysphagia for a long case because generally you can you can tackle it well. Uh, what is the differential diagnosis? Uh, 
and list the investigations you would order and outline the management of one malignant box. So we won't say what it is. We will not give an uh, open, uh, open clue, but we will say either malignant cause or a benign cause. So even in any other question, you decide the best you can answer and then you answer. Um, just move. The working diagnosis is uh, now you must first start by, start by saying that dysphagia can, is, uh, dysphagia can be either esophageal dysphagia or uh, pharyngeal dysphagia. So it's very likely that uh, this situation is uh, esophageal dysphagia because this uh, history fits into that. Uh, but passing by, you can always mention the causes of uh, pharyngeal dysphagia as well. So, as you know, the first thing you have to think of is an esophageal carcinoma and then gastric cancer at the gastroesophageal junction eating into the esophagus and uh, echolasia cardia and other motility disorders we have just mentioned and uh, strictures and external compression. This is the part a lot of students uh, tend to forget. Tend to so always any lumen this is a basic teaching from third year that uh, if it's a luminal organ and there's a obstructive symptom, always think of intraluminal, mural, mural is in the wall and extra luminal. So uh, esophagus and the dysphagia, uh, same thing applies. So think of carcinoma. So this type of uh, common five uh, diagnosis of uh, five diagnosis, common five diagnosis is important for all the main long cases and main topics. So be prepared by now. Dysphagia, or whether it is hematemesis, or dyscasia, bleeding PR, hematuria, as I was telling earlier. So these five causes should come to your mind. And when you're answering also, in the answering sheet, just write down all these five things first, and then your discussion will rotate around these. Because in our answer script, we'll be watching for and looking for these these causes. So if we suddenly find that you have missed a large, say, motor disorders are missed, or external compression, extra luminal compression of esophagus is missed, then you are going to lose some marks, not all. Less common causes are these causes of pharyngeal dysphagia, that is upper dysphagia, and uh, this knowledge is basically to answer some of the uh, uh, MCQs. So remember, uh, this plumber vincent syndrome uh, and pharyngeal pouches, just a basic knowledge. You don't have to know all the details. Bulbar palsies and neurological diseases and globus hystericus, if at a viva, mostly at the viva, now we all have, most of you all have finished viva by now, but passing by we might ask you, you heard about the word globus hystericus. It's a psychological disorder. And uh, dysphagia lusoria, many people would have learned it by now. Those are abnormal vascular rings going around the esophagus. They are rare, but just to know what it is, uh, is expected. And then the uh, left atrial, uh, now remember that MCQ is probably mixed up. So it has to be left atrium because it is lying on the esophagus. So when you have this oxart dilatation of uh, both atria uh, for, for go, go bovinum, uh, this dilated left atrium can be a cause of dysphagia. And uh, if you get a long case and uh, you have taken the history, these are the things in the history marking scheme we expected you all to have asked from the patient because always all these history marking sheets when you are listening to your long case we look for about say seven to ten main points which should be included in this history so for dysphagia uh, we will be just listening to you to ask whether you have uh, got the history whether it is intermittent or progressive because uh, intermittent dysphagia which is going on for a long time 
is generally uh, a benign pause. So suddenly halfway through when you are saying that when you are describing the dysphagia, because as you know when you are giving the history, the first part is just you know introducing the patient and then second part or the main part is that you are you start by saying this patient is presenting with dysphagia and then you have to describe dysphagia. So in this, this description, we look for these uh, points, whether we have asked whether it is intermittent or progressive and whether it is for solids, liquids, what comes first? First solids and then liquids or other way around or both. So liquids first, is echelasia and solids first. So you have to be ready with the interpretation as well. That's the important thing because you should know why you have asked this because halfway through the examiner, but generally this is the first examiner, he will throw a question and ask me, why did you ask that? So you should be able to ready with the answer. And uh, regurgitation and the timing of it. So just after meals, a few minutes after meals, long after meals, because that gives some idea about the site of the obstruction. So as you will uh, appreciate, laryngeal pouches, so Sengkas diverticula, uh, you get early regurgitation. Just after swallowing, the uh, patient might regurgitate because there is hardly any time for food to travel along the esophagus in this situation. And then plumber vinson syndrome, uh, again, it is early regurgitation. And echelasia and uh, strictures, the regurgitation is rather late. It, not very late, but uh, after deglutition, food has to reach, as you know, the retrosternal area, and then when it gets blocked, you regurgitate. So, uh, just know the interpretation as well. Pyrosis or heartburn with associated with dysphagia is a sign of gastroesophageal reflux disease and also hydrocellia. And by now, you should know uh, that these two are two different diseases. I am sure your general surgical lecturers would have told this repeatedly. They are two different things because uh, one need not to have the other one. And then we again look for these marks. See this, there are 10 marks in our marking sheet in our, in our mind. So if you get 6 or 7 of these, then generally you pass that part of the history. So the focus history again, you have to, somewhere you have to include whether he has had in the past CVAs, bulbar policies. Generally, these things are rare uh, surgical cases we give you. Uh, but in the history, you have to ask these things. Question of corrosives at any stage. So when you are telling these things in your history, these points, rest of the history becomes unnecessary. For those that, that part of the history, actually, we just, you know, subconsciously listen to it because it doesn't carry much marks. So we are looking for these points. Expa explosive right cause, you know, that shows that echelasia with night regurgitation or tracheosophageal fistula malignant. And features of anemia, angular stomatitis, when you keep on saying that this in your general examination or general your history, uh, actually these things should come under, under examination. Uh, you are thinking of uh, upper esophageal uh, webs and it's important and loss of appetite. So loss of weight with loss of appetite uh, means any idea? This is again a very common question everybody asks examiners. If you have loss of weight, dysphagia, loss of weight and loss of appetite. Comes, you know, extending into the gastroesophageal junction. Correct. You have to think of it, well, right? You have to think of a gastric malignancy causing this feature. And if there is no loss of weight, then loss of appetite, then you have to think of uh, is vital malignancy. So here you ask what are the main questions we expect from your history. And uh, then this examiner will move into the second part. What are the examination findings? And what did you look for? And generally, more or less, you know, we can assure you that you will not find many, apart from some emaciation, uh, because you can't take food uh, 
emaciation and nutritional features like anemia. Uh, in dysphagia patients, you don't find very many uh, physical signs. But uh, then look for these things. But next natural question will be, if you say that uh, you didn't find anything, uh, what were you looking for? So uh, straight away you go for these things, general examination, weight loss, malnutrition, uh, all the nutritional signs. And uh, then under the examination, general examination, anemia, pallor, anemia, poilonychia, you have to be lucky to see one at the exam even because you don't see them very, these features very commonly. And uh, jaundice always look for uh, and voice quality. Voice quality is important because uh, hoarseness means uh, advanced esophageal malignancy. There's a possibility that as you know, the recurrent laryngeal nerves and uh, laryngeal nerves are opposed to these factors. So, voice quality, change of voice quality uh, in the history and the examination, you have to mention. And oral cavity, just ask the patient to say ah and check the tongue movements and gag reflex. At least you will, you should say that I check the tongue movements and uh, gag reflex by saying ah uh, to see whether there is any problem in uh, pharyngeal muscle movements. That is to exclude uh, uh, pharyngeal dysphagia. And uh, again, uh, when it comes to the marking scheme, these are the few things we will, will be asking you uh, to see whether you have checked for those, emaciation and malnutrition, uh, neck masses, the same thing we were discussing just now. And neurological signs are there, hemiparesis, cranial nerve palsies, and um, lung signs. You can just say that, you know, you listen to the lungs and you didn't find anything. And uh, always when you are telling this to the examiner, don't wait, him, wait for him to ask, why did you look for this? So just you keep on saying, get into that habit of saying that, I check for lung signs uh, to see whether there are any, there is any consolidation or who are entering one side or the other uh, to make sure that there is no aspiration pneumonia. And uh, abdominal signs, like any other long case, you look for palpable liver and uh, suggest, you know, low esophageal cancers with uh, liver deposits and uh, or gastric cancers in that case with liver deposits and look for free fluids. So what you will probably you, have, you should do is that when you are giving your examination findings, you say that I look for neck masses, neurological signs, neck masses for this, neck masses to see whether there are any metastatic cervical nodes and uh, or a malignant goiter okay, and large pharyngeal pouches and uh, neurological signs for this. So you give the interpretation without actually waiting for the examiner to ask. Let us uh, move quickly to uh, uh, investigation of uh, dysphagia MCQ. 24-hour pH measurement is the most accurate method of assessing suspected GORD. Any guesses? Because uh, there are number of ways you will diagnose GORD out of that. Yeah, I think uh, you are quite good in this. That's true. Because endoscopy is not 100% reliable because what you find in the endoscopy might not tally with 100% uh, with uh, a GORD. So, sometimes you can have GORD without any endoscopic findings. So, uh, this is the best way to do it. And barium meal is better than barium solo to diagnose the cause. Any guesses? Some of those little MCQs I gave uh, at the beginning uh, would have covered these things. Yes, you have done your homework. Barium meal is better than you know, diagnosis of the cause. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, you have gone wrong. So one has it right. Yeah, it's false. Uh, barium meal is, you must know, that it's not done very frequently nowadays, but still we do. 
and the video meal is just fluid. So for dysphagia, when you're diagnosing dysphagia, if you give fluid, fluid will run through the esophagus so fast, right, quickly, it will not show some uh, space occupying lesions. Barium solo is done with a barium paste. So you, you solo it during either screening. So when you solo it, move slowly, solid move slowly. So that it will be covering the esophagus. Whether you are going to take a CT or just a plain X-ray with that, will show, give a better idea about space occupying lesions. So when you are investigating in dysphagia, if you are given the choice between meal and solo, always it is solo. Barium meal is basically not for the esophagus, it is for the stomach and the uh, duodenum. Okay. Uh, laparoscopy should be done prior to esophagectomy. The laparoscopy should be done. Any guesses? Uh, true, 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 true. Is it the previous one or the new one? True, false, mixed answer. Yeah, the answer is true because staging is extremely important and uh, uh, staging laparoscopy is now has become almost standard because none of the other investigations which we'll be discussing in a minute uh, like CT, MRI or endoscopy will not give a hundred percent knowledge about the situation of the abdomen, whether there are any whether there are any, any peritoneal deposits, if there are any uh, omental deposits and also it's important to know the state of the stomach because you are going to use the stomach if you are going to do esophagectomy. Esophagectomy is a very sort of a, is a important and major undertaking. So you have to be 100% sure that this esophagectomy is done with the intent of cure. So if you suddenly find that during the esophagectomy, uh, there are if no deposits or peritoneal deposits or mental deposits or maybe minimal amount of uh, ascites uh, in the abdomen, uh, I think your whole operation will be abandoned. So I think for staging, uh, they recommend, it is recommended that uh, staging laparoscopy uh, is important. Uh, I think there will be people who may not, who might not skip this, who might skip this step, but uh, depending on their expertise and their experience. But you have to, when you are at the exam, you have to go by the guidelines and the standard practice. Manometry is essential to diagnose motility disorders. Manometry is essential. Any idea? Esophageal manometry, you know that. I mean, if you are not quite clear with it, just uh, go to the YouTube and then uh, watch a five minutes, uh, three minute clip, video clip. Yeah, uh, most of you all have got it right. Yes, manometry is important because none of the other things like barium solo or CT barium or imaging will not give a clear idea about motility disorders because sometimes the diffuse esophageal spasm uh, might not have distinct radiological features. But if you have a corkscrew esophagus, you will see that and uh, achalasia cardia, you, will, you might see that. But uh, manometry is important to prove it. Negative esophageal endoscopy will safely exclude a malignant cause for dysphagia. Negative esophageal. A negative esophageal endoscopy will safely exclude malignant cause of dysphagia. True, false? Um, well, the answers uh, false, false. Some people say yeah, false, say false. Yeah, okay. So most of you all have got it right and uh, extra luminal malignancy especially, I mean just because the endoscopy is negative, malignant causes, we have not mentioned here in this stem that uh, it is a esophageal malignancy. Malignant cause can be a lymphoma, it can be a retrosternal uh, mass of malignant lymph nodes, uh, so uh, like that. Uh, you can uh, have other malignant causes which are causing dysphagia. Uh, dysphagia endoscopy, there is a possibility that 
negative and still it may be a malignant cancer. So that is why it is false. Regarding dysphagia, let us move to another uh, MCQ. Regarding dysphagia and heartburn, that is pyrosis, in 60 year old smoker, which of the following statements are not true? So that is basically a true, true false answer. Heartburn, mimicking, and anginal pain needs cardiac opinion. True, false? Yeah, I think the most, some of the mixed again, mixed response uh, is actually a must because don't uh, you first you exclude because these things are coming in old 60 year old men. Uh, there is a higher chance of having a cardiac event rather than gastroesophageal reflux. Even the people with chronic gastroesophageal reflux, GORD, if the uh, retrosternal pain is becoming atypical or severe, always better to get a cardiac opinion. Because there are many a times that has been attributed to gastritis, to GORD, and then suddenly find that is uh, angina. So it's always better for older people. So suppose it is 35 year old man, you can argue, but older person always had, you should have a cardiac opinion. You have to always show that you are uh, thinking safe, safely about, uh, you know, all the problems. Your uh, judgment is safe. Pyrosis with weight loss is a red flag symptom. Pyrosis with weight loss. Pyrosis means uh, retrosternal burning sensation, the scientific term. Uh, red flag symptom is that you know something you will think of doing more investigations to look for a sinister cause. That's called red, red flag symptom. True, false? Yeah, I think everybody has got it right. I think that's uh, true because uh, always with a weight loss, significant weight loss, though it is just a retrosternal burning sensation. There may not be even dysphagia. Uh, always think of a malignancy. Because there are many people who are just attributing that to this pyrosis to uh, retrosternal uh, burning sensation to gastritis and GORD. You occasionally find uh, that there is a malignancy, especially in elderly. Barium solo is the ideal radiological, oh, sorry. Um, Anyway, the past has come. Barium solo is the ideal, radi ideal radiological investigation. Uh, I have pressed the answer. Mm, it is false. And can you say why it is false? Um, barium solo is obsolete. That's the important thing. Uh, um, somebody is asking if statement. Is true answer is false. Okay. Uh, what statement? Uh, this question is asking which statement is false? Yeah, yeah. Actually, this can be can be taken as uh, yeah. The actually. Uh, which of the following statements are not true? So, if you are given, I mean, this is, I think, just, uh, you can take it as a true false uh, question as well. Uh, what is not true? So, uh, true answers you don't mark. Because uh, the way it is going to be given, you have to decide what is true and false, basically. So, uh, Barium solo is the ideal rate which is false and uh, because uh, it is not the ideal radiological, radiological investigation because it is, uh, nowadays we don't do barium solos at all uh, in uh, teaching hospitals. It's always CT, contrast enhanced CT. And uh, preferential dysphagia to liquid suggests achalasia. That's true. And uh, Bohav syndrome. Bohav syndrome, OGD is the first line investigation. Everybody knows what is Bohav syndrome, I suppose. Uh, yeah. 
Bohoff syndrome is anybody can answer? Uh, Bohoff syndrome is that uh, there is a esophageal rupture after uh, severe bout of uh, vomiting. Uh, you can get low esophageal rupture. I think we have a picture here. Yeah, here we go. This Bohoff syndrome. There are a couple of pictures here. Um, what happens is. Uh, the esophagus ruptures and then you get leaking of esophageal contents into the mediastinum and uh, OGD is not the first line treatment or uh, investigation because it will be dangerous to uh, put a OGD with uh, a ruptured esophagus. So the first investigation will be uh, diluted contrast and uh, uh, contrast enhanced CT and a chest x-ray maybe, but uh, when you are suspecting, when there is a this classical picture. Okay, uh, let us move on fast, time is uh, moving. So, uh, investigations, uh, just to pick up a little to your knowledge, if at an exam, so if the second examiner, the first part is to ask what are the investigations you will do to come to a diagnosis. Uh, you have to mention the number one is upper GI endoscopy. Interpretation will be that it will show uh, the details of the obstruction and then uh, whether it's a stricture or not. And then sometimes uh, you see that you've not mentioned it here. Um, Barrett's is Fergus and it's vagal uh, reflux disease and it's give us the opportunity to provide biopsies. So, the question will be asked, you know, when you are saying that upper GI endoscopy, what advantages do you have? And uh, only problem is that you must say that these advantages are there as the investigation of choice. But uh, if the obstruction is near total, you might not be able to advance the endos endoscope through the lesion. So that you will not see the extent of the lesion or the other side of the distal part of the lesion. So because of those reasons, uh, you can't stop at upper GI endoscopy alone. So you have to sometimes resort to, uh, if you can't go, if you can't go past the obstruction, you have to resort to uh, doing uh, contrast studies as well, imaging studies as well. That's why the second one is you must say that barium solo and barium meal. You must say that these are these are now of more of historical value. Uh, now what is done is the third one and all these classical signs of parrot beak, shouldering, rat tailing, yes, rat tailing. these are all the historical words nowadays but just know that uh, because sometimes the examiner is, uh, uh, wants to know whether you have gone through uh, the text. So uh, these classical signs are no longer important. You go for contrast in enhanced CT because these are the these were the days where the soft tissues were not seen. When you do a barium solo and barium, you can't see soft tissues. So you have to go by these parrot beaking and shouldering, rat tailing, okay, these appearances to diagnose the cancer. But now we have the CT which will show the lumen and the soft tissues both. So, uh, actually these things become obsolete now. Only the non-availability of CT, which is rare again in our part of the world, uh, you go for these things, uh, barium solo and barium meal. And in a, contrast in a CT is a must, it's an adjunct. When you are writing the CQ ones also, you must say that it's an adjunct or to upper GI endoscopy because it will be important for staging. So it will give the idea, some idea about the extent of the spread and the involvement of lymph nodes. And also when you combine it with all these three areas, neck, chest and abdomen, you will get an idea about the metastasis as well. And esophageal manometry, if you are strongly suspecting uh, uh, motility disorders, like what I have given here, echelasia, coxcrew esophagus, jagas and diffuse esophageal spasms. 
and these are again just to uh, recapitulate your knowledge uh, your CT appearance and these are the these are echograms I'm going to rush through this uh, and these are sometimes these could be uh, OSPs because sometimes the OSP you get a big there's a nice picture like this and then the questions asked identify the investigation name one abnormal those are two hand questions. Can you repeat the bottom? Can you can you all answer the first picture? If this was there at the OSP, OSP station. Raptors is like this, Melody Wise. Melody Wise is a new to you for some rapture. Because of rupture, you bleed. And no, heart, no, 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 no. Rupture of the esophagus, Bohaus. And uh, in both instances, uh, yeah, uh, right, GORD, yes, GORD, Barrett's. Yeah, here we go, Barrett's. A yeah, uh, lot of guesses here. So, uh, what you can see is the esophageal mucosa is white because it's squamous. And the gastric mucosa, intestinal mucosa is pink. This has been told to you several times. So it's a margin you see. Uh, if it is go going beyond this is gastroesophageal junction, the pink margin is creeping up, then always, I mean, it will not be a sharp margin. It will be it will look like this. So it is the Barrett's. Okay. So, uh, and there's another MCQ I think I can remember somewhere. Uh, Barrett's becomes malignant only if this uh, get replaced by gastric muco epithelium or intestinal epithelium. Because you can get two types of Barrett's. One, the gastric epithelium can replace this vaginal epithelium. Other one is intestinal. The remember, intestinal metaplasia. Intestinal metaplasia is the more malignant version. So, if it is when you take biopsies and if it comes as intestinal epithelia, you have to keep a very close eye because that is the more dangerous. Next picture, any guesses? Can guess? Second picture is here. It's a difficult one actually. This is a mucosal ring which comes at the lower end of the esophagus. And it's called a Shatsky ring. It's similar to plumber Vincent syndrome and Patterson Kelly. Uh, you get a mucosal in, in plumber Vincent, you get mucosal webs. And if you get a mucosal ring like that, very sharp ring at the edge, okay, it's called a Shatsky ring. Uh, it's thought to be congenital and it could be acquired as well. So you can read about it. Next one. It's a very obvious one. Okay, here we go. You can see this uh, white thing there here, stuck in the lower esophagus. In a, it's a foreign body. It's actually a fish bone. Right? Then move on. Fourth one is this, and you can see part of the part of the uh, endoscope also. That means a retrograde view, because generally the first three pictures you are looking the forward view. What is in front of? Yeah, it's here. Yeah. It is a paraesophageal hernia. That is a rolling hernia, actually. Rolling hernia. Uh, because you can see that uh, it's, it's marked. Now, the arrow marks the pathology, what we expect you to answer. Next one. That is esophagitis, reflux esophagitis, GORD. Uh, it may not be Barrett's. Barrett's is a permanent change. And you can get esophagitis temporary changes, and that is it. Next one, you can see this is the lesion. I'll rush through this because of the time constraints. It's a esophageal diverticulum again, and that one. And you can see that this is a, is a smooth edged one with a lot of inflammation around this and very narrow lumen there. So. This is actually a 
is for the stricture. It could be either acid stricture from outside or from uh, regurgitation. Generally, outside, the acid you take is, everybody should know, in this country is acetic acid in rubber industry. Uh, last one, I can't see the picture here, but uh, uh, it's covered with your question board. I don't know how to put it You can reduce it. No? Yeah, this is obvious. I think you all should get uh, right. That is uh, obvious cancer, carcinoma. Okay, and this is the these are the common two pictures will come in hospice. This one and that one. Uh, yeah. Okay, now let us move. Uh, let's see how far we can go. Yeah, again, um, these are also auspices. They are also auspices. Uh, and uh, these are barium solo pictures, barium solo, and sometimes you can get a CT, vertical construction of CT with these pictures. Uh, we can keep on guessing. Yeah, what do you think this is? The first one? Anyway, I'll, uh, I think we are running short of time, so... Um, let us open this, and these are, you can see that these are this is Zenka's diverticulum. You can see this, if it says that this is a barium solo, this is the upper esophagus and the pharyngeal area. You can this is marked here with the arrow. It's a, it's a, it's a pharyngeal pouch or a Zenka's diverticulum. Uh, this is just a esophageal diverticulum. Okay, and uh, this has gone other way around. I think the Zenka's diverticulum. Uh, here, here, this is, this is the one you have to concentrate on. And uh, these are just esophageal diverticula, the first two pictures. This is the upper end of the esophagus. And uh, and other one, others are strictures. You can see long acid strictures, narrow. And the sliding hernias, the esophageal junction is gone up. And carcinoma, you get ragged edge, achalasia, classical parrot beak or bird beak at the end, and dilated esophagus. These are, this is the hook screw esophagus or esophagus pass. And uh, endoscopic ultrasound is also used. Just remember when you are writing an answer, just to mention it. And uh, for staging of esophageal cancer. And pH monitoring for OG. Uh, I think we are, we are... We can continue for another few minutes. Uh, let us move on for another MCQ. Echalasia cardia can be treated with, when it comes treatment of this stage, yeah, can be treated with endoscopic botulinum toxoid to toxin injection, Botox. True or false? Echalasia cardia. Yeah, it's true. I think everybody knows that because uh, it's one of the endoscopic methods of treating uh, Echalasia cardia nowadays. And resection of middle one third cancer is called Heller's operation. These some of the common famous names you have to know because you are going to be house officers and then you are going to write diagnosis cards. So you have to be familiar with these names. So we expect that. A resection of middle one third of cancer is called Heller's. False. But as you all know, Heller's is for. It's cardiomyotomy for uh, achalasia. So, Heller's operation is for either laparoscopic or open Heller's is for achalasia. And uh, one third, middle one third cancer surgery is either uh, Ivor Lewis or Macumen. And endoscopic mucosal rejection is an, uh, is an accepted treatment for Barrett's disease. Endoscopic mucosal rejection. True or false? Remember, this is a revision class, so you are supposed to get all true, all, all, all correct. Yeah, uh, there's a mixed answer here. True, true. Uh, that's, okay. that's good. Yeah, it's true. It's a well-known uh, 
endoscopic uh, mission nowadays apart from biopsying if the biopsy shows uh, uh, mucosal lesions which are very atypical and uh, highly de differentiated then mucosal reaction is a standard treatment all patients suspected with post endoscopic esophageal perforation should be prepared after doing endoscopy suddenly if a patient complains of severe chest pain always think of a perforation which is uncommon in experienced hands but it could happen so remember as house officers once the patient is returned to the ward if he complains of severe chest pain and breathlessness dyspnea think of esophageal perforation it's an emergency because mortality rate is high so um, all patients suspected with post endoscopic esophageal perforation should be repaired that means you can you have to uh, do a do a surgery that is generally a thoracotomy and repair it true false is false somebody uh, it's a mixed answer again some people think it's true but it's false because uh, what you do is diluted uh, uh, contrast in the barium or diluted contrast uh, nrct urgent and it has to be diluted because uh, and then in a small tear with the minimal leak uh, management is conservative with iv drips nil orally and uh, antibiotics and observe zenkas diverticulomy is most often treated with that is pharyngeal pouch is uh, most often treated with left neck exploration diverticulectomy and trichopharyngotomy true false the last one uh, false true true false is again a mixed answer i have got here uh actually answer is false nowadays the uh, the open operation is not very uh, commonly done in tertiary care centers it is uh, actually endoscopic stapling uh, technique uh, you can watch a video or just go to google and check it uh, open operation is kept for large diverticula and uh, if the stapling doesn't work so endoscopic techniques or minimal invasive techniques are used in managing sinus diabetic endoscopic stapling uh well i think uh, time uh, five more minutes uh, there apparently i think we'll just rush through this I'd like to finish this because uh, um when it comes to now we gave a question i seek you if i seek you says that you know uh, mention outline the treatment outline the treatment of one malignant cause that was one of the questions i uh, says that you always select co is for us and this uh, knowledge here uh, about the treatment of co is for us is useful when it comes to the long case management also because the second examiner might decide to rush through the investigation part and then uh, might ask you to outline what we can do to this patient so uh, this is how you summarize the treatment um always when you are answering uh, how to treat a malignant disease uh, just go by the modalities available so start by doing what the surgery can do and then move on to what radiotherapy and chemotherapy you know there are six or seven modalities i have been already i have told you surgery radiotherapy chemotherapy immunotherapy hormone therapy and molecular targeted therapy molecular targeted therapy and finally the palliative care so your discussion should be under these headings and some of these headings may not be relevant for some cancers so uh, you uh, basically what uh, you have you have to say is that you know surgery is the only method of cure but generally by the time the patients reach you Uh, they are pretty late in this part of the world, and uh, carcinoma of the esophagus may not be a curable disease by the time they present with advanced dysphagia. So, if it is an incidental finding or an early diagnosis, when you do endoscopy for something else, you find it. If it is organ confined, it is confined to the esophagus, then it is curable. But most of the time, when it is dysphagia, it is too late for a cure. but anyway the uh, surgical methods of removing the cancer and the esophagus are uh, uh, 
uh, esophagectomy, uh, total esophagectomy, and that can be done in a uh, few ways. You don't have to know the technical details, but uh, you can generally what happens is you remove the esophagus and then replace it with the tube of stomach. So you pull the stomach into the uh, upper part of the pharynx, low part of the pharynx and anastomosis, replace the esophagus. So if you remember that way, then of course you have, you say that idea of total esophagectomy is remove the esophagus and then replace it with a tube of stomach. And you have got about 50% of mark, but if you want to score more and uh, show your knowledge, you can see it can be done with a laparotomy to mobilize the stomach and thoracotomy to mobilize the esophagus and remove it and then do the anastomosis in the chest. You remove the esophagus and pull the stomach tube into the chest and anastomosis. And that is called Ivalu's operation, Ivalu's. But the problem is that if you leak, the patient can die of leaking into the mediastinum and the pleural cavity. So because the anastomosis is in the chest. So to overcome that, as most of you will know, this McEwen operation is there, where the incision is made in the neck. Third incision is make, made in the neck and the stomach is pulled up to the pharynx and anastomosis come up in the neck. So even if the patient leaks, leak will be into the into outside you know it's not to the chest and all these these both these operations are nowadays can be done laparoscopically or thoracolaparoscopically you can put a telescope into the thorax or and the abdomen and mobilizing the esophagus removing it making the stomach tube pulling it anastomosing everything can, can be done laparoscopically or thoracoscopically so it's becoming popular now uh, Minimal invasive methods. And transhiatal esophagectomy or in the technique is nowadays, of course, not done very frequently, where only an abdominal incision is there, and through the abdominal incision, you mobilize the esophagus. And again, the anastomosis is in the neck. So you have an abdominal incision and a neck incision. These things, if you are interested, spend five minutes and go to the Google and uh, have a look. Uh, and all can be done thoracolaparoscopically. Then you have to always, when you are mentioning that, surgery, then radical radiotherapy, if we just go on past surgical excision, uh, radiotherapy is radiosensitive and squamous carcinoma uh, and neoadjuvant chemotherapy is also recommended. And locally advanced cancers, you can't do much, so you can do a palliative resection to just restore soloi. Whole idea is to restore soloi. And you can do a laser reboring can use endoscopy and with the laser you can make a hole there and you can put a stent there is with the stenting uh, and if there none can be done feeding gastrostomy to keep the life going on and uh, palliative chemotherapy and chemo uh, regimes you don't have to remember but just know that the chemotherapy is effective as a palliative or a neoadjuvant uh, before radical radiotherapy um, yeah, I think we'll rush through these things. Uh, these things, if, I, if time permits, next class we will uh, discuss. We'll start from these mortality disorders. Uh, and, and then we will move on to uh, dyspepsia next time. Uh, and then uh, I think I've taken a lot of time there. So uh, we'll meet up again when, when you are free. Uh, the next class will be on uh, dyspepsia. We will try to finish the GI series.